Um, so this group is actually being hosted by uh, RAG Meetup. So we launched RAG Meetup in uh, February 2018, so only a couple months ago. So Arlen Nagara is here, and he's the organizer. And my name is Ken Sinarelli, and I'm the core organizer. Uh, you will see us floating around. If you have any questions, if you have any ideas for the group, please let us know. Uh, we're more than happy to talk to you about this and make this uh, a really excellent kind of group in the Waterloo region. So as I said, uh, this is being presented by Waterloo Region Azure Group, uh, only last <coughs> month ago. We already have 47 members. If you haven't signed up, please use the Bitly link and sign up for the group. Uh, we will be communicating future events through the group, um, and uh, we'll probably do a similar type of event um, in that uh, we'll announce it, and if there's a paid event, we'll go through event price and uh, do it that way. We're also on um, Twitter. So this is uh, our Twitter handle here. If you want to follow us there, we're doing all of our announcements through there as well. This is our hashtag. And for the day, so uh, Global Azure is the global hashtag for the day. So if you are tweeting um, and you want to uh, show up, uh, throw a shout out about this event, this is our hashtag. That's the Global Azure hashtag. And you can follow along. There's 250 some odd events going on around the world right now. So uh, special thanks to all of the sponsors. Um, these are all international sponsors, global sponsors that have uh, contributed money. Microsoft is the big sponsor. They're, they're buying all the food for the day. So they're buying um, all of the Subway lunches for every event across in 250 events. So it's a lot of cash they're throwing out. And a lot of these other people are throwing out swag prices, which we'll talk about in a second. So everyone is going to get a sheet uh, if they haven't already. I don't know if you've distributed the sheets. Um, everyone's going to get one of these uh, with multiple hundreds of dollars worth of free trials and stuff. So um, make sure you get one of these before you leave today. Uh, so you can try all of this stuff. There are um, some limited uh, sign-up periods, so you need to sign up before April 30th. Uh, so they're not valid till they're, um, you need to get your uh, sign-up in, and then you'll have your three months as long as you've signed up before April 30th. So we'll get, um, yeah, that's going to be the sheet. We'll, be, we'll distribute these at some point, and you can come uh, and get that information from us. As well, we do have raffle prizes. Uh, JetBrains is throwing in a one-year personal subscription. This is worth several thousand dollars. Uh, Sarah Brada and Posh Dilly. We also have those. We also have, are these the passive there? Yes. Uh, everyone who attends as well is going to get $300 worth of Azure credits. So for your five bucks, you're getting 300 bucks, a chance to win thousands of dollars, plus another couple hundred bucks, plus free lunch, plus <laughs> coffee. So yeah, I think it's five bucks for its fun. So. <laughs> um, we are also going to be organizing another event in a couple of months uh, called Global DevOps Bootcamp. So this is all around DevOps uh, within the um, enterprise. Location to be determined. Uh, we were doing a trial run here. Given the amount of people we got here, we might not come back just because it is a little cramped. So we might look for a new venue. Again, we'll announce the information through the Meetup page. The Meetup page is actually closed. It's just an information page right now. We will launch through um, Eventbrite to kind of get signups and stuff going. We might do the same thing. Five bucks get you in and that kind of thing. So June 16th, we'll talk about that, and that's uh, probably be a little bit more hands-on, but we'll, we'll see how that goes as well. Uh, a lot of you might also know that um, the sister group to this group is something called Canada's Technology Tri Triangle. Uh, Lori Lalonde here is the organizer of that group. This group has uh, been around for 15 years, if you've never heard of us. Uh, we do a lot of .NET talks, but we also do Azure talks, SQL talks, DevOps, all of that kind of stuff. So if you're ever interested in coming up to that, we actually have another talk um, this Wednesday coming up, talking about SQL and SQL transitions with Michael Swart. Uh, if you want more information, again, we do all of our communications through our meetup group. Uh, so we do a newsletter through there, we do all of our announcements through there, we do all of our signups through that meetup group. We're also on social media as well, so you can also follow us there. We do all of our announcements through there as well. As well, um, we do two, usually two meetups during the month. We do uh, a meetup on the second Wednesday and the fourth Wednesday. Uh, on the second Wednesday, Lori hosts uh, more open source mobile kind of talks. And then on the, on the fourth Wednesday, I'll do more straight ahead .NET. SQL As well, there is another little conference coming up. Um, it's called the Microsoft Cloud Power User Conference. It's going to be on Friday, June 22nd. There's going to be stuff about Office 365, Azure, all of this. It's actually being held at the Microsoft headquarters down on the Sun Road. So not too far away. Um, 
it's a nice, if you want to get out of the office for a day, um, come and check it out. It's all free, food's free, attendance is free. If you want to come in and uh, check it out, uh, powerofthecloud.net is how you can find information about that. And if you have any questions about any of these uh, links, come see me afterwards and we'll get you the information. So here's the agenda. Uh, we're in this portion right now, uh, intro and housekeeping. We're going to do dev test labs in about two minutes with Sharon, and then uh, advanced Azure web apps with Roy, and then uh, continuous delivery for web, Azure web apps with Rob at the back. We're going to do some lunch and networking, and then we're going to get into app service environments, Azure event grid. We're going to do an AMA Q and A of some of the speakers who are left around, including Lori, who actually works for Microsoft and has a lot of information about Azure. And then we'll do a close up and we'll drop those prizes. If you need to take off, do not worry. We will get you the uh, prizes if we do call your name. Um, we will email you the codes and stuff like that. So um, who actually works in Azure? Who's heard of Azure and who's done anything in Azure? Cool, okay, so this might be a little bit of a reminder, but we wanted to do a quick level set. It's gonna take a couple seconds and we'll just kind of bring you guys up to speed on what this is. So you might have seen this before, right? There is no cloud to somebody else's computer, except that the computer actually looks like this. Um, this is an Azure data center under construction, right? So this is just racks and racks of servers with lots of cooling and security that you can't even drive you know, 500 feet within. And these are the Azure regions. So I, when I Googled this, I didn't realize the last time I saw it was 38, they're up to 50 regions now. So um, you can see that all of these are availability regions and availability zones, um, but still kind of centralized in the top half of the world, um, you know, like not too much in the bottom, and this is kind of barren and stuff. So still got a ways to go to kind of get the cloud to everybody, but um, again, my Azure is leading the space. So why Azure? It's just something to think about while you're going through this, because there are lots of options out there. There's Amazon, there's Google, there's IBM, there's Rackspace, you know, all of those. Um, you might have seen this. It's become Microsoft's chief focus. They've actually reorganized the entire division to um, focus on the cloud. They've rebuilt it around Windows. They've um, let some people go. They've brought new people in. And um, you know, they're tearing up the business to make sure that Microsoft is focused on the cloud. So just something to think about as you're moving forward, the cloud is gonna be the way of the future. Uh, this is their powerhouse right now. Last year in 2018, uh, 2017, they made $18.6 billion just on cloud alone. Office used to be their number one, um, number one revenue agent, and now cloud is slowly eroding that. So uh, and you can see the top 10 here. So Microsoft has actually overtaken Amazon and IBM. Uh, I wouldn't call service now. Um, Cloud piece of crap, but uh, yeah, whatever. Never even heard of Workday. So yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, and Microsoft is not just Microsoft anymore. You might have heard that uh, Microsoft is now Linux and CentOS and Ubuntu. You can get all of this kind of stuff um, within the Microsoft framework, and I'm, I'm sure the speakers will talk about this at <coughs> Infinite um, throughout the day. So. And you might have seen this before, this is what's called the Azure Periodic Table. It's a little bit old, uh, just because it's still referencing uh, Document DB. But um, yeah, these are all the different uh, types of uh, areas that you can explore, the different types of services that you can get within Azure as well. So again, a very quick overview of what Azure is. We can talk more about it throughout the day. If you have questions, please approach the volunteers and the speakers. Uh, we'll be more than happy to help you. Uh, if you uh, want, when you get your Azure credit, this is where you're going to go and this is where you're going to play with it, um, in the portal.azure.com. So you're going to be able to get that there. And some quick references. Um, I will share all of this in a, in a dedicated GitHub repo, so if you want these links later, you can come and find them there. Um, some of the Get Started um, references as well. So that's it for me. We're going to bring Sharon up and she's going to start talking about Azure Dev Test Lab. So, yes. Uh, can you ask the people who doesn't want to have your slide? Why? Because can you still get <laughs> Who doesn't want to have your slide? Who doesn't want to have my slides? You're going to send them, you're going to send them, huh? Uh, I'm going to, it's a dedicated GitHub repo we're creating, so I will share the link to the GitHub repo. Oh, yeah. so I missed that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we're, we'll share the link to the GitHub repo and then, um, yeah, everyone can just download them whenever they want. Oh, okay. so, yeah, I saw another question. Okay. No, I was just pointing oh. to Sir Yassau. Okay, perfect. Uh, uh, so Roy Kim is actually a data platform MVP, he comes from Toronto, uh, he's agreed to come down and uh, talk to us about advanced uh, Azure web apps. 
Before we do that, though, you might have seen George is filming here. Um, does anybody have uh, any objection to being filmed or having their voice appear in a video that's going to be on YouTube? Please raise your hand if you do. Unless we get some of the ad revenue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's your answer, George. So. It's zero right now. <laughs> it can only go up. Okay, so just, just so you're aware, um, yeah, George will be, he just took a pan of the crowd and your voice might appear on the video, so if you do have any concerns, please come see me or George and we'll, we'll address those. So, uh, so yes, uh, you are up and running, so uh, so this is Roy, uh, Roy Cruz from Toronto, Data Platform MVP, and uh, please give him a round of applause. Great to, uh, to be here and uh, be part of uh, this area of Ontario. So um, the, let's get started. Okay, so my topic is about applying advanced techniques or scenarios or options uh, along with Azure Web Apps. So uh, with this session, you know, <clears throat> I'm just going to assume that you know a bit about Azure Web Apps. If you don't, just think of uh, a web app in, in the cloud, and then basically what are some um, things, uh, services, Azure services that we can use, uh, you know, in addition or to, to complement a web application, a platform as a service web application, right? So <clears throat> the advanced techniques or scenarios or options that or considerations you want to, uh, that I'll talk about are four things. So <clears throat> the application gateway with web application firewall, Okay, uh, Azure SQL VNet integration with ASC V2, um, using Azure CDN with your Azure Web App, and also within the Azure Web App, uh, auto scaling and using Visual Studio for load and performance <coughs> testing. Right. So, so, um, so I'll, uh, the, I think you know these four talk. I think it's a presentation on its own, but I'm gonna go very quickly. Right. Because um, I like to show like what are some capabilities that you can do with in Azure with web apps, and I find that a lot of people don't know, right? Or, or maybe some of you do, but I just want to go over this. So I'm gonna go very quickly so that your takeaway is, oh, okay, that's what it's about, and that's what it can do, and and then you can go home and kind of do a deep dive and figure out, right? So I do have a few demos, and um, but feel free to stop me, right? Um, and ask some deep dive questions. I, I really don't mind. I love to have discussion as well. Okay, so, um, and Roy Kim, I've been, you know, kind of doing Microsoft Technologies, you know, started with .NET, and then I did some SharePoint, and then some BI work, and data analytics, and then now I'm kind of more delving into uh, uh, Azure, right? Azure IaaS, I've been doing some of that SharePoint um, on server farm in Azure IaaS the last year with Power BI Report Server. Um, I'm an independent IT consultant. Uh, I also graduated from the uh, University of Toronto. Um, and so, so some questions, so that I can get a feel from the room, and I want to kind of, uh, so that I can direct my, my um, you know, um, uh, my uh, speaking to your levels. How many of you are currently using Azure App Service at work? All right, awesome. Okay, cool. And, uh, so for those that are, didn't raise their hands, you know, uh, do you guys want to use that? Looking to look at using Azure at work? And if so, what are some blockers? Can someone, what are some blockers for adoption? Anyone? Fear. <laughs> Fear. Fear of? Well, we're government. Sorry? We're a government agency. Okay. So in terms of security, data, like data, data privacy. Sovereign. Okay, yeah. got it. Yeah, I, I, that's a. That's a common one, and I like to do a blog series covering those topics in the next few months. So, uh, Azure Security, and actually, I'll talk about a little bit of security that will this a little piece of the puzzle for <coughs> overall kind of that framework, right? Uh, okay, and then um, so Daniel, what kind of apps in Azure do you like to build? You know, especially with uh, Azure Web Apps, whether it's at work or at home or as you're learning. Anybody wanna? Throughout there, like open apps or you know, kind of .NET Core or just .NET apps or even PHP, Java. Okay. So, um, so so what is Azure App Service? Um, it's really a platform as a service that you can 
you know, host, you know, uh, actual web, you know, browser-based, um, uh, UI-based web application, or it could be a, just an API, or it could be a mobile app, right? Where the mobile app, where that one um, distinct feature is really notifications, right? That uh, Azure App Service provides, right? And it's a platform as a service offering. So as you guys know, so as you guys know, it's really you don't really manage the infrastructure. You don't care about patching. You don't care about the OS level or the hardware, um, really, right? But you just build with it, right? And you do configure kind of how much RAM and CPU, and I'll show some slides on that. And then some some key scenarios that you would use kind of ideally for web apps is very high traffic websites because of the scalability. Um, also, global traffic websites because you can deploy uh, your web app across multi regions, and you have a something called a traffic manager that will kind of route your where, where, depending where the user is to, to, uh, to the closest kind of web app, right? So it's globally distributed, um, and it's more ideal for web uh, public facing because you know it's uh, by default it's kind of open up to the internet, right? Um, and so here, I just want to show that you know when you create an app service, okay, um, it's really an app service plan. So you you can go from you know free all the way to two hundred eighty-two dollars a month, right? Or actually, sorry, a thousand dollars a month, right? And so the, what you get here as you go up, you get more features and capabilities. There's custom domain, HTTPS. Uh, more instances in terms of uh, horizontally scaling, which I'll talk about more. Um, you know, to have you know staging slots, kind of like your dev test kind of staging slots, right, or copies. And then when you promote up, it's just a matter of kind of doing a swap, like a VIP swap, right? Um, and you know, backup, and then also that traffic manager for geo availability, right? So as you go up, kind of those models. So. Um, you know, overall, it's it's, it's still kind of it's not super cheap, but um, but compared to let's say you know VMs, it's still cheaper, okay. But uh, I have a tip at the end about using CDN to to make it more cost effective. I have a bit of a trick, okay. Um, so the the first thing I want to talk about is the Azure Application Gateway, right? So what this is is that. Um, it's really a networking appliance, okay? And it's a platform as a service component, right? So what it is is that you can host um, many applications behind it or even virtual machines. So I use it for virtual machines kind of in the, in the real world. And what it does is, you know, a various features as SSL offloading, right? Um, uh, kind of like uh, uh, routing and you know you have like an internal IP or internal URL and you have a public facing you want to manage that um, and also uh, what it has is a, a web application firewall so that's the one I want to kind of get at more is that from an application security standpoint the the web application firewall uh, has you know uh, you know uh, denial of service it has you know cross-site scripting kind of prevention, right? So anything wrong, kind of your cyber hacking, right? So really, when you when you make your web app, you don't have to be concerned with that anymore, right? You don't have to make SQL injection. So, uh, and then here's the other capabilities, such as uh, again end-to-end -end SSL uh, or SSL offloading, right? Like so, at your app gateway, you have your certificate. But internally, you don't have to have uh, HTTPS. It can just be HTTP, right? Meaning, the, the little for benefit of that is that you have it's not a bit of a performance overhead to have uh, process HTTPS internally, right? So the the gateway uh, offloads that, you know, takes that uh, overhead, right? It's a small small advantage, um, and uh, health monitoring and multi-site routing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So. Uh, so here's a, a diagram in my drill of how to, like in very detail, but I'm not going to go through it, right? Um, is that, you know, first of all, this, this is your app gateway, and then this, you have your web app, okay? And in your web app, uh, you have your, your, your uh, DNS, your kind of the name of your web app, .azurewebsites.net, that's by default, okay? 
And so you tell your app gateway um, something called a backend pool that points to that. And then on the on the front end side, you know, you have your public IP, and then and then you have like your domain name, like like for this app I did arkin.ca, okay, and that points to the public IP, and that's that's all that is needed on the public end, public side of things, right? And the app gateway will take care of kind of the internal side, right? So um, I have a blog post. Uh, my blog is working by see just, just search for application gateway and I have a full rundown of, of this stuff, right? And I have a PowerShell script that actually builds out uh, completely these two, right? These two components, right? Um, and so, um, and in terms of public access, you know, I restrict it by restricting it at the, at the web app level, right? So again, you build your web app, you take advantage of the web application firewall, right? That will, you know, prevent or detect, you know, cyber attacks, right? So that's the key takeaway here, right? So for your, um, for your application security, right? So, so, so in the web app, Okay, just, um, so th these are the list of kind of rules, okay? Um, and, you know, you guys know, you know, such as cross-site scripting, SQL injection, right? So there's really, if you look up at the top right, there's really two settings, right? Um, you know, you enable or disable, you enable it, okay? And then the mode is detection or prevention, right? So detection, it'll kind of log and everything. Uh, prevention, you, you get blocked, right? And so, in terms of uh, my real world experience with this, so I, I, I use this in front of a SharePoint farm in an IaaS environment. Um, and so this was all turned on, right? And remember, the rule set is, old, if you guys know about O, I don't know about it too much, too deeply, but it's like an open kind of set of rules for kind of detecting, um, you know, these cyber attacks, right? So the OWASP rules, version 3.0, there's like a, there a 2.9 that you can select, right? And then you can check uh, off kind of which ones you want to enable, right? Such as cross-site scripting or uh, SQL injection or all these other ones, right? Uh, so, so that's taken uh, care of for you, right? Now, <clears throat> you can get false positive, which I, which I discovered was, since I use SharePoint, right? Because um, it's kind of a COTS application, right? So um, when we accessed it, I think one of these rules hit it, it was a false positive. Right, and I think it was just by design of SharePoint that um, it, it responded in a certain way or it, it took the activity in a certain way, right? Um, against APIs or something like that, when you start to load it up and then you visit something, I think these are a little bit sensitive, right, to that, right? So you might have false positive situations, so uh, therefore, either A, you want to uncheck those, but you got to evaluate is that, is that, uh, is that a safe thing to do, right? Is that permissible? Uh, do you want to put it in detection mode, right? And then kind of be more of a passive uh, state, right? And then detect after, and then you kind of fine tune. So that's kind of what the web app firewall is about. Any questions so far? Okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, is detection versus uh, prevention universal, or is it can yeah, I flag yeah. it on or off based on the rule? Good, that I want good to question. Know? So I was going to um, talk about that next, right? So it, to me, yeah, it is uh, pretty global, okay. right? And it sucks because let's say, as I showed you in the first uh, uh, diagram, where there was many applications behind it, so it's, it's global across all those. So. Again, the workaround is you stand up another web app firewall, yeah. right? And they're they're about uh, twenty five dollars a month, right? And it's in, it's Nginx. If you know Nginx, that's an actual actual physical like software hardware appliance. It's a Linux based. That's that's what this is running off of, right? And uh, it's just again, it's it's a managed. It's it's covered up, uh, black box, and it's a managed service, right? So it's pretty global. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I want to inquire to the product team about you know, how they're going to make it more granular. So if you go to feedback.azure.com and you select uh, web app, no, application gateway, maybe somebody posted that question and there's a response on, okay, we're reviewing it, we're planning for some granular uh, support, or, or, maybe, or maybe it's around the corner. So, yeah. yeah so actually part of the question is already, uh, you already answered. Mm -hmm. uh, another part is, 
do you configure the can you configure this just for certain web apps within your network or uh, you have to configure for all the web apps behind it uh, um so uh so so you can have one app gateway and then do a multi-site to host or to be in front of many apps but are you talking about specifically for these settings? Yeah, I mean this part. Yes, this, this part, part here. Yeah, it's part. like it's. I think it's uh, back to the question: Is it global? So I don't. I, I I haven't seen it. Like it's not like a lot of granular. Like only for this application or for this URL or whatever to your backend uh, apply to. The, I, I haven't. I haven't really seen that. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty. I find it pretty global. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So. You know, again, this is a platform as a service offering, right? So you don't get that grant of control. But if you need it, <laughs> then you stand up Nginx or what was it, Barracuda Firewall, all that stuff, right? And that will have it all. You know what I mean? So, um, or maybe it can be done through PowerShell, perhaps. So, so when you're um, when you're looking at offering a platform as a service, that's what you're going to run up against, right? <laughs> that uh, full spectrum of control. If you can't, does it doesn't serve your requirements or it's not on the roadmap to have those type of things, then you have to fall back on a kind of IaaS infrastructure of a service kind of approach, right? So, yeah. So question about this uh, SharePoint uh, use of like when you monitor or, or react down a service or block, right? Yes. The so, the, so the SharePoint will be kind of a container of monitoring what's happening to your... Web oh, no, 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 no. SharePoint was the actual application behind the scenes. Yeah, we put, so uh, it was an infrastructure service, like VMs, I installed SharePoint. So you were serving SharePoint to a community, so to speak. Yeah, 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 exactly. It was it was public facing, right? Okay. Like you have to log in with like form space yeah, authentication. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then we put App Gateway in front of it to, um, you know, to make it more secure against like cyber attacks. And so but how do you look at the result of the, either the, uh, how the monitoring or yeah. the, uh, Denials. Assuming you have to log up that stuff, I guess it's beyond the, to what you talk. Or uh, so you're asking, have, have you seen the logs of the yeah, detection? Yeah, what you about that stuff? Like, you know, like, uh, yeah. how frequently uh, you get. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, so I haven't delved into that too much, right? Um, so my experience was when I was in prevention mode, like I should get an error in the in the uh, the web page, right? As an end user, right? Mm -hmm. And it got blocked or. Or, or, or did I see something where it, the page didn't load fully and it got stuck, mm -hmm. right? So there's definitely is monitoring um, in there and you'll, you'll see it. It's, it's another component. You'll probably have to go into the logs or hook in uh, operation management suite or log analytics, yeah, right? Can, so. uh, and that's uh, another uh, sure. question, I think it's very relevant. I, I heard in town there's actually a company that's that, that fight. The guy at the gym all the time, he's probably living they essentially run a company who checked out people's website and do kind of stuff like that to make sure they get hacked and they take care of that, you know, um, um, intangible risk that most human beings <laughs> that okay. are not super duper programmer and aware of that stuff uh -huh. don't really know it exists by eventually mm -hmm. happening, especially for e-commerce when you have data or, you know, important stuff, like yes. a bank or whatever. Uh, or a big engineering firm, say, who work in a nuclear plant, whatever. Yes. They don't want their data to be corrupted or to be invaded, right? Yes. So uh, this company is that for a living. Are they using kind of stuff like that, or they have a super duper thing? Oh, the super duper. Again, this is more of a, okay. Amateur version, I mean, yeah, small yeah. time version kind of thing. Yeah, it's a small time version. So the heavy duty stuff is, again, like Barracuda Firewall, Nginx. But when right? Linux has yeah, service provided by human beings, the thing is like a trip for 25, like eight or eight hour shift. It's okay. like checking five company on a console or something. Oh, I There's see. There's people doing that for a living right now. Crazy okay. stuff. Oh, right? that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, big time. Time. yeah big time. Okay. Big time. Yeah, they were, I don't think they'd be using this. This is too simplistic. So this yeah. is good for your, you know, again, if you're starting out in Azure and uh, you're even an a application developer, you know, and, and you're not a big IT admin guy, I think you can pick it up. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's not But what do you do about the data? I mean, say for example, uh, you, it's very cool that you detect invasion. Yes. You do something about it, or you just know, you know, somebody's yeah. getting on your back and trying to steal your stuff. Where is the report go? Who's looking at oh, it? Okay. What do you do about it? Uh, I, I don't know. That's, that's a different topic. Uh, that's a different... We need another guy. You know, we need another guy to come in. You know. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. You get the stuff, then. Yeah. You know what? That's my that's my question, right? Oh, no, that's a good question. That's a purpose. Right? Yeah, I, I don't know. 
<laughs> you know well, that guy. So cool you use like log analytics in yeah. order to, to set up different uh, notification systems or uh, parsing have systems. A different project. Yeah. That's well, because all you're doing is you're, you're trapping your syslog, right? Yeah, so you're yeah. trapping your syslog that, that's going to get output by nginx. Oh yeah. Cool. Right, and then you can you can pass it through whatever system you want in order to understand. I'm seeing a high number of this type of attack coming from this location, and that's what you're looking for. Right, but in the end, it's just raw data that's just provided to you. Mm -hmm. You have to decide what you want to look for within that data, right? But you'll use like a log analytic or some other sort of some other sort of Azure system, which I'm, at this point I'm only assuming would be analytics, uh, in order to parse that data natively. So this is just the net to catch the fish with you. The fish is another thing. Yeah. Exactly. You want to fillet? You want to cook it? How do you, you know? What do you want to do? That's totally up to you. But there are so, sorry if we can, no, we can just move on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll, I have Thank a lot to go. So I'm going to skip the, the little demo for the sake of time, but um, but you guys get the point, right? Um, okay, so the ne next point number two, or top the subtopic number two is app service environment. So I'm not going to go into this because at uh, two o'clock, uh, the app is going to go over it. So I don't want to steal the thunder, but I just want to make a, a point here, right, with app service environment. Um, so just just very high level, it's it, it provides uh, like more network security opportunities, right? Um, especially for enterprise for like compliance, and which I'm I'm very interested in, in hearing about. And I'm I'm still learning about those things. But the the only thing I want to get to is, and I and I built this out, is that you know with an app service environment, you know your app uh, is part of an, in a more of an isolated, not in a multi-tenant, in an isolated, especially network isolated. So that you can uh, hook it up to uh, your your production or virtual network, just like Shannon was talking about, right? And do site to site VPN to your internal network, right? So it can be internal or external facing. But the only thing I just wanted to, to talk about was that to do um, the VNet integration with your SQL <coughs> server. So SQL Server is a platform of service. It is by default kind of public facing, okay, by design. But you want to keep that traffic between your app service and your web app and to SQL within the Azure network and not going outside and coming back in. So in a way, it's kind of a network force tunneling. So the, the, the key terms you, you want to understand is uh, a service endpoint. Okay, so the app service is inside a subnet. That's by design of app service environment. And in the subnet, you turn on something called a service endpoint called uh, Microsoft.SQL. There's only another option like Microsoft.Storage, but I think those will, will, will grow um, for in SQL. And then uh, you go to your uh, SQL server, and you'll see an option that will uh, option for your subnet, right? And then you turn it on, or you allow this subnet to have direct access to your uh, SQL Azure, right? So, and, and then one thing that was a little confusing to me, when you go to, when you create SQL Server, there's really two um, uh, concepts here. SQL Server, right? Like it's not on-prem SQL Server, it's a SQL Server, SQL Azure, and then SQL Database. So you can have multiple SQL Database inside your uh, SQL Azure or SQL Server, okay? But the firewall settings is at this, at this level, at the parent level. So even though in the UI you'll see settings for firewall settings, you can't just say, oh, only this database have it connected. It's gonna to apply to the whole SQL Azure, like the SQL server level. So that's one little point. It was, it was a bit of a confusing thing for me and I had to uh, learn, but yeah. This same pattern is gonna be available soon using just the App Service Premium uh, without the ASE. Okay. So there's a public, public preview, I think, for App Service Premium to okay. do uh, VNet integration. So you can actually enable um, the firewall. Oh, without, awesome! That's they, know. ASCs cost seventeen hundred bucks a month, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. Oh, Canadian. Yeah, it's yeah. about seventeen hundred. Okay, yeah, so. okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but you, you can talk about that more. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, oh yeah. So here's the settings, right? So, um, so this is the web app, okay? Um, and then on the right side is the is the firewall settings. And then down here, you see virtual network, and then I'm using the, the app service environment, right, that I set, and then, so this web app is pointing to here. And it's all within the SQL Azure network. Okay, cool. Did you change the theme there? It's all black, right, usually? Yeah, 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 there's like four themes and okay. stuff like that, right, so. Yeah. Um, 
And so here's some so these slides will be open. Okay. And then the, the third topic I want to talk about is uh, Azure uh, CDN. Okay. So you guys know what a CDN is? Okay, content delivery network, you know, more for kind of caching, right, for static content and the little sort of, so it's globally distributed. So um, as you see here, so this is a very high level concept is that your origin, it, you know, it can be a web app uh, in Azure, it can be a storage account, um, I think there was like one or two more other options, but the point is some origin of kind of uh, files or content, right? And then you have uh, CDN, which is kind of the popular ones are Akamai, you know, that's a popular one that's out there, right? And then you have your client, which is just basically your browsers or phone or whatever. And so the CDN is obviously globally distributed all over the place, right? So that, um, uh, so that when you're making a request, right, for your web app, and then um, it will return like a URL, like let's say, for example, you make a request to a web app, some, uh, the obvious static content is JavaScript files and images, right? And really, those things should be hosted in a CDN because they're very kind of long term, you know, longer term, you know, like they're gonna stick around for like a week or something like that, right? And so, really, the network um, latency gets reduced to, four, let's say, here in this situation, 40 milliseconds. So it really speeds up performance, okay? So that's what ideally you use a CDN for, right? So I think it's a, you're gonna do a very, very high performance application. Uh, definitely a CDN is, is the way to go. Um, you know, and then when you update your content, like a JavaScript file, you redeploy, right? And, um, in, but then you have to make sure that the client kind of, it's called cache busting, like it recognizes that um, a new one has come up, so the browser will you know, recache it on the browser side, right? So that's the concept of the CDN. And so um, with Azure CDN, it's very easy to point it to a web app, right? So that your content uh, can be cached. Um, so <clears throat> here's the pricing options, okay? It is, one thing is it's really cheap, okay? So there's three, so uh, standard, which is offered by kind of two providers behind the scenes, right? So Verizon and Akamai, right? So as you can t tell, it's kind of like outsourced. Like it's not, I don't think it's fully, uh, Microsoft Azure that's uh, providing the service, right? So it's kind of, again, it's just kind of abstracted. It's kind of layered in front. So you have here, down there it says, for the standard, it's like uh, 10 cents per gigabyte, or up to 10 terabytes, okay? 10 cents per gigabyte. That's really cheap, right? Like, you know, how many websites out there, you know, minus video content, right? You know, can you can make, you get to like a gigabyte, you know what I mean? So for 10 cents, you can host it. So, and the premium here, I think you get real, you get real-time analytics uh, and something called token authentication. Uh, I th think that would mean that, um, like typically in CDNs, uh, my understanding is that they're pretty anonymous, they're public-facing, okay? Um, just you know, just make sure that the, the data that comes that's served up, like that's that's made private, right? But then if you're okay with having your JavaScript file, as long as it doesn't have any sensitive information, or even your images, right? Like you know, even though um, they're they're in a secure like website, you know, who cares to have you know like uh, your icons in a, in, a, in, a, in an image like cached, right? So that's something. But I guess token authentication provides some security there. Um, and the really cool thing is that it provides custom domain and HTTPS support, right? Um, and I'll talk about that uh, very soon uh, to make things uh, cost effective, right? So, um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, I just talked about that, the pricing. So, <clears throat> you can use this to really make your website a lot cheaper, okay? So, really, if you think about it, if you didn't have caching um, and you had like thousands of hits like an hour or per day or whatever um, or a thousand users and, and then for a thousand users they're, they're accessing and that's like many many requests for images and JavaScript files and HTML and video and everything, you 
your, your Azure Web App is getting hit, right? Remember, there is uh, server uh, load that needs to be, uh, uh, like there, there's, sorry, there has to be, you're paying for it, right? That compute to serve up that, um, uh, that you know, to serve up that content, right? So memory and CPU, basically, right? Um, and also some disk storage too, right? So you can offload some of that cost to a CDN, you know, more for static content, right? So as, as an example, <coughs> I built a, and I also have a blog post, I built a, I used a free tier Azure Web App, okay? Doesn't have, you don't have custom um, uh, uh, domain support, you don't have HTTPS, okay? But I put a CDN in front of it, right? But the big assumption here, if you're, if you're gonna do this like in a production, is that you, your website has to be fairly static, right? So it's, it's, I think it's, it fits well for like just an informational brochure website for a company like About Us, Contact Us, our services, products, and that's it, right? It's just fairly static in some, some video, sure, why not, right? And some images. But not like a dynamic, like a database driven or anything like that. Although you could, you could definitely could, but your caching strategy is more complicated. So you can do, so if, if you, let's say, okay, so a good example is if you're a small business, you're an ice cream shop, you know, maybe you can try this out. This will probably work, right? And basically it'll cost you like literally uh, nickels and dimes and quarters per month, right? Instead of going through, let's say, GoDaddy, you gotta pay like $15 a month or something like that. Right? So that's what I'm trying to, trying to say here. Right? So again, you can manage your cost of your Azure Web App by having CDN, right? and so instead of saying, okay, I'm going to have a standard or a S1, S2, S3, you can go for an S1 with a CDN, right? and you kind of mix and match that, right? and then you get a more cost-effective solution. Does that make sense? So you're suggesting to using Azure as a, as a web page server for static or relatively small change yeah, yeah, that's the whole point of CDNs. And, and that will, uh, and if you have, for example, a new web page, uh, and let's say an application, and yeah. mobile, and there's like only three things you want to send the customer: first, an information page, then a decision information page, yeah. then after that, uh, that's it. Just, would it make sense to have one of the pages coming out from a, um, the one that sets it coming from a CDN, the one that requires data, little data for yeah. that dynamic? Yeah, you, you can, you can. So, um, so when you dig into the CDN, there's caching rules, right? So you can say that, okay, by a certain uh, parameter, cache this. So you, let's say you would, uh, whatever, www.compose.com slash, and then you say this, this page is static, then you want to say, okay, cache that page as, as it came out, right? So you can do that way. And then anything that doesn't hit that caching pattern, you know, or that strategy, that caching plan, then you go, uh, you don't cache it, you just get that data-driven uh, dynamic uh, page. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, because I feel insecure about <coughs> I'm not formally, formatting my question properly because I'm doing them on the architecture side. But yeah. I guess I don't want to burden people with that. Yeah, 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 so. We can ask you in private. Yeah, 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 no problem. So, um, you know, another thing with the Azure CDN is that let's say you're a podcaster, right? There's no web page. You use a storage account. You put in your podcast or your video, and you just share the URL out there. That's that's an option too, right? Um, in terms of CDN, but you can do that straight from a storage account, anyways. But anyways, that's the so. But, but if you do this like that, let's say you have a movie that run by uh, a little thing that will run like for I don't know. You the podcast with like two minutes and you, you know this. Uh, so let's say put a number. Let's say for example, it's gonna be two hundred megabytes. Okay? Yes. And then so the gigabytes only gonna be five. Is every time a customer look at these things, yeah. it's one two hundred megabyte and uh, uh, no, five. So. And, oh, is it is it for the say, how do you calculate is gigabyte is gigabyte of uh, data out or gigabyte storing in here and in call I believe it's uh, stored. Oh. So well, actually, it, that, that's a good question. I should look into that. Is it a diligence. million time ask or one time? Because it mm -hmm. requires something at that CDN site to do something, right? Yeah, I know that's a good point. Um, so that's something to look into. Okay, uh, it's, not, it's not a yeah. pure static storage that CDN does something. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah it's in terms of serving it up. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I yeah. like the first idea, the yeah. like the story is in the fixed context, yeah. but yeah. I don't There's know. usually additional costs for outbound with, with the CDM. Yeah. So any outbound, outbound transfer per month. Yeah. So the right. cost you give us is just the static storage cost. Storage, yeah, and then yeah they'll give you the static storage cost, and then there'll also be uh, data transfer fees. Which should be small for this yeah. exchange. Yeah. But we're not informed on that, we assume, on this information? You think it's like... Yeah, you know, that's something to look at. I think that you made a good point there. So, yeah, I, I think something to look into. I'm going to look into that as well. Yeah, yeah, and overall, in general, there's data transfer uh, costs with anything with Azure. Right, uh, on outbound inbound, there's no data data transfer cost, but outbound, there's, you have to assume there is. Yeah. So okay, uh, the last point, and I have <coughs> I have seven minutes left, is uh, auto scale and Visual Studio load testing. Right. So uh, hopefully I can get a demo on this one. So very very simply, okay, cloud computing. Right. Um, I think one of the uh, unique aspects of uh, cloud computing you can get as opposed to on-prem is, you know, uh, scalability, especially automatic and dynamic, right? Where there's predictable, unpredictable, plan, non-plan, you have Black Friday, 80% or 70% in a 15 minute, uh, 15 minute interval, then you say, okay, horizontally scale, okay, add another instance, like a one or two more instances, okay? Or you can go by each number of HTTP requests, or or HTTP queues, or memory consumption. So there's a lot of rules, okay? And then uh, you can have a rule that said, and I put a rule in there. Well, if the uh, H uh, CP percentage is let's say uh, close to like zero for 15 minutes, then uh, you know uh, go down uh, in instance, right? So go the other way. So, so basically, that's what this setting is, and you can go more granular. Like these uh, settings, right, can, can happen, let's say, on a weekday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, this time range, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So it's pretty, pretty cool in that way. Right. So why do you need a default in the scale set? You have a maximum and a minimum. Well, why is there a default? What uh, does that default do? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Set the bottom it's, like, right it's like the preferred amount of instances. But you have yeah, a minimum, yeah. right? Why would it ever go down past that preferred amount? Uh, Great question. Yeah. <laughs> so I said again, preferred as in. So you see at the okay. maximum, minimum, at okay. the bottom right there, right? Well, this one right here. No, no, no. Oh, default. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. that too, yeah. Oh, well, is that what you're talking about? Default right here? Or? Yeah, yeah, scale sets, right? This, yeah. is, your, this is a scale, you're scaling so same, up. Same, same. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you're scaling up. Yeah. It hits your your CPU usage hits eighty percent. Yes. Spin up another one. You have two now. Yes. Keep going up to eighteen. Yeah. And now traffic's died down. Super Bowls or whatever. Yeah. Eighty falls below eighty. It scales back down. Yeah. So that's the minimum. Yeah. And you have the maximum. Yes. What's the default? Uh, good Probably question. Good I didn't. Set. I didn't look because into that. So this, it, depending on, I mean, Azure doesn't exactly turn on time as we know, right? So if it needs to spin up another instance, right, that's going to take, there's going to be a latency in that. Okay. So you go from one to two, right? That doesn't happen like that. Right. It's not Docker, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So if it takes two minutes to get through there, you might say, well, I really want to come out of the, I don't know, the gate with like 10. So this so, is when the metric has not been reached or right. triggered. Right. So you start off Same with the default. And, and, then and so that you're ready to go, like you're hot. Say, right. okay, so you can warm it up. Yeah, yeah you don't it. have to pre-warm, so okay. that would be my guess. Makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It doesn't it doesn't spin up uh, immediately. It lets through my, my testing. So I don't know, let's see if I can do How long does it take to turn on enough? So there's a period I guess. Like five five, five minutes. Yeah. yeah. So you don't want to switch that you want to wait for this. You want you don't want to change the configuration to work. Yeah. But you can do it dynamically. Yeah, the auto scale is nice. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, CPU, memory, and all those features that I saw, right? But um, so you have to have, I think, at least a ba standard plan, or was it basic? Because this says you can scale up to uh, this number of instances. So you can't do the auto scale in the uh, free or basic. Yeah, it's standard right? or premium, the yeah. auto scale. Yeah. Yes. Right. But that, that is, I mean, this configuration is within app service plan. It yes. applies to all the web app or app services within that plan. Yes. Like, yeah. Because yeah. I was not able to read the window, it was too small, but it is not web app specific. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So if you have a web app, if you have an app service plan, and then you have 10 web apps, yeah. those it, it will scale within the plan. So right. if you have nine really slow web apps and one really busy one, it will still scale to yeah. those parameters. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, OK. OK. So I have a few minutes. I'm just going to jump right into it. Hopefully this one works. I just tested it this morning. I just kind of went. So what basically, uh, this is Visual Studio. Uh, have you tried the load testing? Capabilities here with Visual Studio, you have to have Enterprise Edition. No? So, anyways, you can do recorded tests like of uh, your web app visits, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and then you basically, I pointed to an Azure web app, okay? And then uh, I said, okay, 500 simulated users, uh, just keep on hitting it, you know, like a bunch of URLs that I've set up, right? So visit this URL, visit that URL. And keep going, keep going, keep going. Five hundred, and I mean it's uh, step up. So five hundred, it's you know going up, adding up another hundred or two hundred, whatever every ten seconds, right? And uh, oh, really? so, so you may be doing you doing that with uh, a special code you made, or it's a tool that exists inside the virtual in, in Visual Studio. It's a tool in there that yes. does that. Yes. So as you can see here, these are using App Insights. Uh, these are real time metrics that you can see there's a lot of activity being hit right there, right? And as you can see, it's kind of trending up because every 10 seconds, I'm adding another 100 virtual users, right, to give it more loads. So basically, what this is trying to do is hit my auto scale rule, right, to, um, to scale up, add another instance. So I have a rule in there, okay, if uh, CPU is greater than 50%, Add another instance, right? Uh, I couldn't really get it to 80% because uh, one thing was this Visual Studio test, because um, uh, it's it's not fully multi-threaded. It's 32-bit. Even though I put huge, huge size VM, I couldn't get it to like 3,000 virtual users. It starts to crap out. So if you're ever thinking about doing, you can't do extremely high load. Uh, even if you give it enough memory RAM or IOPS in your disk. There's actual like kind of the runtime uh, uh, bottlenecks in there, right? It's not fully multi-thread. I'm not sure. There's a lot of blogs I've been researching, and so, anyways, um, so and then um, I would get an e I set up I get an email when it scales up and scales down. I'm not sure if it's gonna do that now, but uh, with this test, you know, I'm confirming what what you just said. It, it's not immediate, so. You know, I, I thought somewhat, oh, it's pretty immediate because all the marketing and whatever, and you know, whatever those graphs, whatever, you know, somewhat immediate, but it took, it takes some time, right? And uh, yeah, like maybe 15 minutes, 10 minutes, or something like that. To, you know, to, to you know, start the new instance, new instance bigger, bigger. Yeah, to, to, to make it go up. So, so I do have, uh, a, a, okay, so this is an example of me running the, that uh, load test, right? The this line is the virtual users, okay, and um, and so here is the CPU percentage. This is fifty percent, okay. It's like my load test is running like here, and then uh, the number of instances, right? So it went up, right? Um, I think that I try to align this for like, the timing, right? But it, it when it got to here. An instance was created, and then another instance was created, and then I have a rule that okay, when things slow down, okay, just drop an instance, and then you know, stuff like that, right? So it looks like so, even if you are making more machine, your system was not able to test that. To the, I mean, the um, you only had one, you, you generate one transition, but you couldn't go beyond that. Oh, it's because your rule was finite. Sorry, I'm, I'm is it because you only allow for moving to one bigger machine, and the, then? 
you, you think your, your reaction of readjusting the machine size was not set up to be beyond that, or is because the testing was not able to generate enough you know, pseudo ping? Well, well, actually, I put a, a maximum. I said a maximum of oh. three. Right? Or else if I didn't have a max, it would just keep going up and up and but, up. But like you don't seem right? to have more hit. Oh no, this is a CPU. Okay. The CPU, right? Well, the hit we don't see in this picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is the one for hits, but my metric, my auto scale rule was based on CP, CPU. But right? that, once right? you get so, that bigger machine, the CPU will go down? No, not really. Uh, so, so you're not yeah. scaling up the machines. You're adding more machines of the same CPU type. Oh, okay. You're you're not increasing the CPU gigahertz or whatever. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah, 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 yeah. It's like uh, horizontal scaling. Correct. Yeah. yeah, you cannot do vertical scaling. Yeah. You cannot but increase the. So yeah. Have, yeah. That's a CPU, downtime. Right? If you have another CPU, should you have a percentage on each CPU? Uh, no, it, it, this, it's is an an average. Average. this is an average. Uh, it's an average of all the CPUs or all the cores that you have. But anyway, when, you put, when you, you put two CPUs together, if they do, if they work well together, they should kind of ease up. Now. Something is <coughs> something is missing in this picture. It might not, maybe I don't understand. But if you put yeah. two CPUs, if you put two guys, put two horse, because the horse is overloaded, the yes. horse should ease up a bit. The, the, the pulse rate should go down because now with two, the load is the same, right? Yeah, yeah. Probably in this example, your your curve of the number of requests is, is continuing to mount as you're adding users. Usually there's a progression online curve. Mm -hmm. So although you, you would expect that if you had constant load, you would expect it to drop like you're suggesting. But when you have two CPUs, you know, maybe the other right. CPUs not but what, what If you remember, what he was going from was like, okay, I'm going from one request to five requests to ten requests yeah. to a hundred requests. Yeah to a battle yeah. request. So mm -hmm. as he's going through that curve, mm -hmm. although he's added more CPUs, the number of new people arriving in the queue is, is compensating for the fact that that's why you see the, you see some dips there in the bottom, right? Oh, okay. So it, it goes down a little bit and then it rises back up because he's adding more you've, you've even added even more people oh. as you yeah, 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 scale up. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. The time is not perfectly aligned the graph. No, no, it's not, it's not. It's not so perfectly you see, aligned. But you see here, I, I went up like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As time it's, progressed. Oh yeah. Right. So, so as he got yeah. there, he had like five. Then by the time the other one came online, he had twenty. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. yeah I think in this situation, I put a max of a thousand virtual users, right? So in each virtual, it's not one request. It's like probably twenty. Yeah. So, so you you feel you feel that this is a robust way of testing the high volume use, huh? I, I would. You if you run anything public facing and you're not doing this kind of work, yeah, yeah, no, no, you're, I'm not, asking, I'm not, you're asking for trouble. I'm not <laughs> asking, okay, okay, fine, sorry. Yeah, Just no, me, no, we can talk after. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so one thing I want to point out, and I got a question from when I did this, uh, this topic before, and I want to bring it up. Is that well, how about the cost, right? <coughs> so, and uh, I just quickly looked it up. Um, but yeah, when you add more instances, according to the pricing calculator, it, it proportionally increases. Right? I don't know if you guys recognize it that way. So it, co it costs more. It's not for free. Right? So I just want to bring that. It was a question from, from previous, and I wanted to uh, bring that up. Just to, so anyways, um, about five minutes? Yeah. OK. So call to action, um, you know, again, uh, this slide will be up. A, a lot of uh, these things, I have many blog articles. Right, so if you want to know the details and how to do them, uh, if you want to get started, I know a lot. Uh, I always see a lot of beginners, and I really want to encourage beginners on, you know, setting up Azure and all that stuff. And you know, you know, learning is by doing. You know what I mean? So, um, and here's for Q and A. Here's my contact. Um, here's my blog. You know, email me any questions. You know, follow me on Twitter. I, I put a lot of updates and news and my opinions through Twitter. Right? And you know, if there's something that I say that's interesting to you, yeah, tweet me back, you know. What do you think about this? Or whatever fun. You know, I like to have open dialogue. So any quite last questions? A few more minutes. You gonna share that slide with the team? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <coughs> Is there right. anything you have to do in Visual Studio to prep for this app, to use app app web service? Like do you have to okay. like to control your session or do you do you use start with a specific project type or do you just say I've got my MVC app and I'm ready to push it into this. So for, for me, uh, yeah. that's that's just what I did. I just <clears throat> treated like a normal MVC. But is there any specific you know Azure Web App settings that you need to keep in mind, right? Yeah. I believe there is. Um, but uh, there's, there's a good article 
called Migrating to Azure Web App, and it has a really like oh. fine grained list of. And I think uh, that would be uh, considerations, okay. right? So, uh, I, okay, from my experience with Azure Web App, I just treat it as if I'm building like just a standard, and it works really well seamlessly, right? <coughs> but do uh, take into consideration like load and performance, right? I think that don't don't buy into like don't buy into like. Microsoft saying, oh, it's fully scalable, it's a cloud. When you get into like, uh, like different areas where there's, there's uh, bottom, typical bottleneck areas, like disk IOPS, or, uh, there even even the networking behind the scenes, like, I think those are um, some gotchas, right? Where you get performance bottlenecks, right? Uh, especially with the networking, I hear stories or from people or in podcasts where they use storage account for like files and they have a web app but the storage account, the disk IOPS was very, very slow, even though they had the premium, right? Or the networking to it, like that was a bottleneck, right? Because uh, it's software-defined networking, and there's many layers, right, for that, right? And, and also the nature of, of uh, 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 these platforms of being multi-tenant, you can have a noisy neighbor, right, possibly. Like, those are just considerations. So don't make <coughs> uh, these, these ass um, assumptions when you're kind of, uh, you know, presenting a solution to management or to your team, saying that, oh, <clears throat> you know, it's a cloud, it's covered. No, just do your due diligence with like this type of load testing. And I learned a lot, like I did it against Azure CDN and that prompted me to investigate even further. I thought the CDN was very, I did a lot of load testing. I wanted to talk about it, but for the sake of time, but I load tested the CDN, things weren't caching as I thought it would. And when I, when I look at the settings, it's really compli well, complicated for me, right? It wasn't obvious, right? And because you're looking at Akamai's or Verizon's portal, not the Azure portal, you know what I mean? And they have their own way of uh, doing settings. So anyways, that's my, my advice. So yeah, last question in the work. Yes, yeah, so CDN you mentioned, well, what is the best practice across the region, to span it across the region? Is it we have to maintain multiple CDNs per uh, region? I, I think by default, um, it's it's replicated across, you know, that, that general area. I haven't seen any settings where you say this, you know, <clears throat> East US, West US, or anything. I think by default it's just spread out. Okay. Uh, but that's a good question. That's something I need to look into. So I'm not a huge CDN expert, but I just wanted to highlight, you know, kind of what I've, what I've seen, what I've played with. Right? And then, you know, follow up on that. Yourself there. Thank you. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Yeah, uh, it's seemed like a great session. Uh, so, before we pull Rob to come up, um, we've had a few questions about what these are. So, um, this is the swag sheet that we talked about that everyone gets. Uh, these are the offers that you need to subscribe to or, or launch before April 30th, or they will expire. So you just need to sign up before April 30th, and then you can use the multi-months um, after that. There have been questions about this. This is, um, if you don't know, Azure is usually a pay-as-you-go service. Um, so it means you have to give a credit card. With this, you have to give no credit card. So this gives you $300 US of Azure services. Uh, it's equal to $100 per month. So $300 US is approximately 400 Canadian. So this is actually really good. So what you do is um, just follow the instructions on the back, you, uh, and then uh, put the code. Please be aware that this is only active until May 23rd. So do not hesitate. Um, you know, act on it today or Maybe this you weekend. Want, you, have, you have to start before the date. Exactly. Or you, you die yeah, exactly. Exactly like this. This is April 30th. You have to sign up before April 30th. Well, how long do you have to use the credit? Three months. <coughs> Hundred dollars per month for three months, oh, that's it. and if you choose to, you can give it a credit card, and then you can transfer over to pay as you go and just pay for the service that you want, or you can just say no, I don't want to give a credit card, and Microsoft will destroy but that. If you give a credit card, you keep the fee for longer. Uh, no, it's only good for three months, and then it expires. That money expires. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So uh, if you have questions about this or this, please let me know. Um, we will, uh, Rob Kraus is going to take us to the break. Rob's going to talk about continuous deployment in Azure services in about five, Azure web apps in about five minutes. One quick question, is there anybody here who's vegetarian who needs a vegetarian lunch only? How many? One, two, two. Okay, so we have a few number of vegetarian lunches, so 
Uh, we will put some aside um, so that way you know people aren't just grabbing them willy nilly. So I'll make sure that you guys get your meals. So awesome. So we'll let Rob set up. Uh, please come out, uh, grab some more food, some coffee, visit the washroom, stand up, stretch your legs, and we'll get started around ten thirty-three or so. Hello.